What's going on, YouTube? It is Pete coming in hot with another video. Also known as that guy Pete, you just refuse to invite to gatherings. And today, we are here to talk about Ooga Booga. So, some of you who may have or may not have spoken with me in comment sections throughout other videos in the Manosphere have probably seen me use the terminology Ooga Booga, Ooga Booga Brain, Ooga Booga Circuitry, Ooga Booga Programming, Ooga Booga. It's more than just a line that Eustace says, encourage the cowardly dog, Ooga Booga Booga! Ah! No. There's definitely more to it than that. Ooh, fresh brewed coffee, man. This is the coffee where you actually have to, like, blend the beans Oh man, it's just it's it's different, man. It's, it hits good. So, Ooga Booga is basically what I refer to our cave people programming as. Basically, the programming that both men and women have in their heads in order to optimize their survival. So we're definitely going to talk about some things um, that men have some things that women have, and how these things sort of come into play in dating today, intersex relations. So that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about Ooga Booga and what it's all about. And I know there probably is a, uh, a gamma male left-leaning person uh, who took too many gender studies classes who's going to be like, actually, Peter, like, this is pseudo-red pill science and it's not proven. Sure, theory of gravity is not 100% proven, but we can reasonably assume that if I hold this and go like that, gravity is the force that pulls this down to the table, right? But at the end of the day, it's just the theory. This idea of evolution, the theory of evolution, that natural selection... Uh, you know, selects for traits that operate at the greatest efficiency with the best results within the confines of the environment, which is the parameters. So basically, the environment is the nurture, and our reaction to it is the nature, the human nature, to be precise. So that is what we are interested in today. Some of the terminology I'm going to use in this video is going to sound familiar because you've heard me say it in previous videos. While some of the stuff I talk about may be new, but I feel, I think, caught myself, I think it is prudent to just clarify what this Ooga Booga stuff means so that if you're ever talking with me in a comment section, you're trying to understand what the hell I'm talking about, or if you're on the other side of the fence still plugged into the matrix, and you want to know what the hell I'm talking about, um, you can just come here and listen to this video. Or watch this video, rather. So, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to talk about um, just the general stuff. You know, the hunter, the protector, the provider, versus the gatherer, the nurturer, the caretaker. As well as the overarching, um, you know, survival. And, you know, polygamy and monogamy and, and all that. Okay? So, let's begin. Um... As you are all aware, I know this is hard to believe in a postmodern world, but men are physically stronger than women. I know, I know, it's, it's scary. Uh, while women are more socially calibrated than men, I know, very scary that these two settings are the defaults when you come out of the oven. I know, it's scary as fuck. Crap, is that an F-bomb? Moving on. I don't care. I don't make money. Anyway, what we are getting at is this, right? In order for the tribe, which is men, women, and children, we have a need for food, which is a form of resource, okay? That is a form of provisioning. We need to protect the tribe, from outside threats. 
we need a healthy psychological environment to create the next generation of men and women from the children that are currently in the tribe. Okay. And again, these children probably need at least uh, 10 years before they have some sort of autonomy. They can kind of move around and, you know, have their wits about them and figure things out. Okay. And there is also the gathering, which is more, you know, small time resource gathering, like uh, fruits and vegetables and berries and things like this. Now, it's no secret, okay, that due to what hunting entails, which is having more stamina, having more strength, um, being more perceptive, less emotional, more logical, more purpose and mission focused, more driven, no surprise that men would evolve to take on that role over time because they are stronger. They are faster. They have more stamina, strength. They are more logic-based. This isn't to say that women do not possess a frontal lobe. Okay? They absolutely do. This isn't to say that men do not have feelings, but they play to their strengths. On the other hand, the nurturing of the children, the caretaking of the children, the gathering of the um, less dangerous um, type of resources like fruits and vegetables and berries the women do that the men they hunt the deer they hunt the animal the game and they bring it home and then the women cook the food and then the entire tribe eats the food and obviously the men who are the best at hunting the men who are the best at bringing back resources these are men that nature selected for in this natural selection model what that essentially means is that women noticed, essentially, that these men were more desirable. They were desirable because they were the best hunters. They were desirable because they were the best warriors. And they were desirable because they were pre-selected. All the women agreed that, essentially, this man was valuable. And as a result, that man got to breed more than the men that were less desirable. Now, anyone who operates in the modern dating market knows that this terminology is actually very, very familiar, okay? You want to mirror it today, okay? We have the concept of the stay-at-home mom. Of course, feminism fights nature with every fiber of its being, but the idea of the stay-at-home mom, being the nurturer and the caretaker, up to this day, uh, being more efficient at it than men are, that is not a coincidence, the fact that men are better at going out and doing the more dangerous and demanding jobs where you risk your life, that is not coincidence. The fact that a majority of deaths in war are men and that a majority of our soldiers are men, that is not a coincidence. Okay? We evolved to be this way. And war is one of our outlets for male aggression. So, again... We are seeing the things that we saw from back in the days when we were making stone-tipped spears to hunt game, okay? We are still seeing this type of um, gender role at play in 2021, despite the left's best attempts to defy those standards with, you know, just complete lack of success. Complete and utter failure through and through. So, the idea is that men are the hunters, okay? They go out and secure the bag. Back then, the bag was game, food. And they built the shelters with their strength. They built the world for the tribe, just like we built the world for modern times. Again, no coincidence. You know, we hunt just like we take on the risk, riskier jobs, while the less um, risky jobs, like gathering berries, that's what the women did, the caretaking roles, the uh, protector, not the protector roles, the caretaking, nurturing roles, women being more in the nursing positions, that's not surprising, women um, being the primary cooker, cooks, <laughs> cookers, I mean, I guess they, they kind of are cookers for nine months, right? <laughs> you can't say that, Peter, that's not respectful of the women, you can't say that, <sighs> I can't even say a joke anymore, right? 
Okay. On a more sincere note, the women tended to cook the food. Okay. There was home ec class. While for men, there was shop class, right? Men were more with their hands, right? They make the tools, the tools to go out and hunt. Uh, you know, they make the tools to fix things. They were the handy men. I'm not saying all of us are. Nowadays, we're in a position where you, you can kind of just pay a guy to do it for you. Um, ideally, though, you probably should have the, the skill set yourself, though. That would be good. But the point that I'm trying to get at is whether you're talking modern times all the way back to ancient times, men and women had their roles. Men used their physical strength to handle the um, the hunting, the the get um, you know, the protecting, the providing, and all that stuff. And this required a very individualistic mind. A man had to be an individual because you could not be a leader and lead the other men on the hunt. You could not lead the other men into battle against your enemies if you could not think for yourself. So individuality, personal liberty, things like this, very, very important in the mind of a man because they cannot operate efficiently if they do not do this. And this is why women relied on the men for the survival. The men protected them. The men went out and did the dangerous things so that they would not have to. And at the end of the day, they made the important leadership positions that an individualist mind can make. And the one who was most fit to lead led which we often refer to as the alpha. On the flip side, we have women. They were the nurturers. They were the caretakers. They were the gatherers of smaller, you know, less threatening food. You know, the food they gathered didn't have teeth, right? So while the men were out hunting and protecting and building and all this stuff, someone had to help raise the next generation. This is a vital job. That while a man can do it, a woman is much, much more fit to do it. Because that is what she was made for by nature. Fortunately, we live in a modern society where we're in a position where survival is not really an issue. The benefits of a first world society built by men. Be that as it may, however, nature intended it to be so. You carry the children. You birth the children. You raise the children. You take care of the children and nurture the children psychologically, emotionally. That isn't to say that the men do not participate in the children's lives. They absolutely do. But the way they participate is to teach the men how to be men so that they can join them in protecting the tribe while for the daughters, they continue to protect them from all outside threats as well. And by creating more fit warriors, the probability of that survival goes up. And that's what you want. So, I mean, that's pretty much the, the big picture, right? Of ooga booga. This hard wiring in our brain. Why do men have this drive to, to go out and be the best that they could ever be? And get the biggest bag, the most resources that they can get. Why do they have this drive to, to protect people and protect almost instinctively? Why do they have this? And, um, you know, why, why are men more logic-based? They kind of more just, you know, if A is B and B is C, then A must be C and blah, 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 blah. Again, I'm not saying that men aren't capable of, you know, emotion and women aren't capable of this, but the default setting. The three types of brain are human brain, which is here, mammalian brain which is here and then reptilian which is in the back reptilian is like just pure fight or flight like survive 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 mammalian is basically i feel like and um the frontal lobe essentially is hey we need a logical solution to get from point a to point b what's the best way to do that men tend to have this point a to point b type thing while women have what we tend to call the hive mind the collectivist mindset which is why if you give, like, let's say if you give women a bunch of resources, they'll try to find a way to allocate it as evenly as possible to everybody because they have the hive collectivist minds. They think of everything as one. 
while men, they look at it as meritocracy. The one who can manage the resources the best should get the most resources. And then the second best should get the second most resources. And then the third best, and then the fourth best. And that will lead to the most efficient system. In reality, what do we have? Well, depending on the country you're in, you're either going to have like a dictatorship where it's like the men say goes. You have a republic where it's kind of a balance between the men and the women. Uh, but mostly the men lead and the women follow, willingly, of course. Uh, and then you have democracy, where everybody gets a say. Exactly. Whatever it is they're thinking. Just throw shit on the wall. See what sticks. Um, and that kind of meant, brings rise to that quote, the male republic gives rise to the female democracy, which gives rise to the tyranny. Is that a guaranteed outcome? No. Like I said, there are girls out there, plenty of girls who use their frontal lobe, and they're sitting out here and they're saying the same damn things the men are saying. Absolutely. They see the writing on the wall and they're like, oh shit, this is not good. But what we want to understand is that there's this underlying individualist type mindset um, that men had to have in order to be effective hunters, while women kind of have had this hive mind type mindset, which we call today the sisterhood, um, which is a type of mindset where it's like, hey, we got to do what's best for the group or the sisterhood. And we're seeing it all today. And then probably the last bit of just the overarching idea is this idea of polygamy to monogamy, right? So again, how did we go from just having a polygamous society to a more monogamous society? How did we do that? Put simply, when the numbers were low, okay, we were in a position where everybody had to look out for everybody or there was no homo sapiens. It's as simple as that. So when you have a situation where a species is extremely close to extinction or it's really just getting getting started, let's say, um, women are less picky with their mates um, and men get more sexual access. Again, when you have fewer options, options are more scarce and therefore people that normally may not make a deal when options are not scarce and they're abundant um, are going to make a deal now. So no surprise that in the early stages of human existence, polygamy was kind of the default. And polygamy is men having many, many female partners. Many. Because women, listen, they could have more than one baby daddy, I guess, the cave people, ooga booga equivalent of the baby daddy. They could have something like that back then. And it was necessary. The men still needed to go out and hunt together. They needed to provide and protect and build, you know, something like a town where the tribe can, you know, prosper and grow. But eventually it got to a point where the tribe got so big that it was almost like a bunch of little tribes were within the bigger tribes. And then the tribes became families, right? And basically what ended up happening is you had these more monogamous lines where men would have a main woman that he would provide for and protect and he would foster um, that woman's children. I don't think foster is the correct word, but he would help her rear the children. There you go. He would help her raise those children, essentially, by being, um, I guess, less polygamous. And over time... It went from being less polygamous to where we are, you know, up until maybe like 60 years ago, where monogamy was kind of the norm. And then feminism, what it did with the sexual liberation movement and the birth control pill and all these other things kind of happening at once. It just kind of was like one wave of just. And we all just kind of got washed away in it. And now we're sort of back to ooga booga. But the problem is, unlike back in, you know, the really, really old days when Homo sapiens were just kind of getting their start and there weren't a lot of options to go around and polygamy made sense, now we have an abundance of choice. And as a result of the abundance of choice, we create a paradox of choice. And that's essentially what happens. Because we have a paradox of choice, the guys at the top are not committing and they will not play this monogamous role. 
They are going to live the polygamous life that comes with the old way of wired ooga booga. And put simply, the old way of wired ooga booga for a man is get as much punani as you possibly can. As much as you can. Wherever it is. Get it. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. While for women, their wiring tells them, hey, you got all these dudes trying to get you. Get you, get you, get you, get you, get you. Your job is to look at them and go, no, I want the best. I want the best of all of these. I'm not just going to take anyone. I want the best. But the problem is this. When it comes to their role as gatekeeper of relationship, the monogamous commitment, the willingness to make you his one and raise the children with you, make you the mother of his children, that's just not there because of the deregulated nature of the marketplace. But what made the marketplace so regulated in the first place is religion and things like this, but that's a whole nother talk. Perhaps I might do that in another video because religion is based as hell. It's so based. And I'm saying that as an atheist. It's based. But most people, you can't really expect them to have um, sexual discipline or any kind of discipline um, without some sort of faith guiding them. And the fact that most people in the world are still faithful to some degree, to some sort of religion, is a testament to that. And as I said, there's nothing wrong with that. Whatever helps you um, have the guidance you need to live a good life, by all means. But I don't think it's necessary, but it varies from person to person. Now, back to the ooga booga discussion. I got my points here. So as I said, men are trying to get who they can, women get who they want. That's kind of how it goes when it comes to gatekeeper of sex. And when you're talking about monogamy, the other side of ooga booga, men have the pick. It's as simple as that. So what we essentially have, again, is bigger tribes. So within those bigger tribes are smaller tribes, which I guess we can call families. And within those families, you have a head of the family, the man, and then the wife is right next to him. And together, they raise the next generation of that family. And that's where this idea of legacies comes from, this whole tribal legacy crap. Very interesting stuff. And there's a lot of stuff on both the side of men and women that play into, um, you know, having major issues with things that threaten the stability of this family unit and other impulses that try to prevent outside variables from affecting the family unit's stability. So I think that's where we're going to switch over to um, the male side of Ooga Booga and then the female side of Ooga Booga. So let's start with the male side of Ooga Booga. First thing is hypogamy. So hypogamy is this idea of dating down. The idea that as a man, you are probably going to have to take care of women that are lesser than you, which makes sense because if a woman is your greater, then you as the man are not fit to take care of her. You cannot protect and provide for a woman who is better at doing that for herself than you are. Which is why, even to this day, we have women saying, I want a man who makes at least what I make, if not more. That is not a coincidence. Not at all. Um, the reason they want that is because men have a biological impulse to protect and provide. So when women say, oh, you're intimidated that I make more money than you, the truth is there is an ooga booga impulse in the guy's mind. He may not fully understand what this ooga booga impulse is that makes him go, Ugh. he may not fully understand it. But this ooga booga impulse basically tells him, you can't protect and provide for her. You will not succeed. She will inevitably go and seek someone who can. So hypogamy is the force, the ooga booga mechanism behind that, that women perceive as, well, you're just intimidated, when really, it's just par for the course in the circuitry. It tells us, hey, bad idea. The next thing is mate guarding. So mate guarding, men are very, very, very territorial. It's no secret. When men have sex with women, there is a hormone called vasopressin that is released in a man's brain. This hormone makes him more protective of this woman. And 
when others threaten that woman's safety. His aggression comes out to defend her, because to not defend her is to destroy his chances of having a legacy. This is what his brain tells him. This is what that vasopressin hormone tells him. And this ties into why men really have a problem with infidelity. Because when another man comes here and gets his filthy hands all over your woman, and she successfully lets him breach the gates, on a subconscious level, a man knows he failed as a man. He failed to protect her from the outside. But on the other side, on moral grounds, he also knows that this woman does not respect him, and that really pisses him off as well. But the reason infidelity really bothers men is because of this territorial instinct. This man has come in and tarnished my legacy. Usually women will say around this point, well, that's ego. you goddamn right it's ego. It absolutely is. But you know what? If Mother Nature did not program us this way, and we didn't evolve, and didn't have these traits selected for, our species would have died out ages ago. So, at the end of the day, mate guarding, the vasopressin that fuels that mate guarding, the territorial nature that kicks in when a man finds out that his woman may be cheating on him, or is cheating on him. That is all a natural biological response to his legacy being pissed on. I was actually watching a movie yesterday called Closer. It is um, Julia Roberts, Clive Owen, who were the other two? Jude Law and Natalie Portman. And there was a scene. Some of you already know the scene I'm talking about with Clive Owen and Julia Roberts, where he's basically just like asking all the intimate details of her infidelity. He's asking everything. He wants to know. He wants to be 100% sure. He wants to hear from the horse's mouth before his brain just snaps and says, I will not protect and provide for this woman anymore. This contract, this biological bond is null and void, but he has to hear it. And when she's like, why is the sex so important? Why do you need to know how he, he and I got it on. Because I'm a fucking caveman. I'm going to let that F-bomb go because it's from the movie. But he said, I'm a caveman. And he's so right. He's so right. I'm a caveman. We have the hubris to believe that because we have inhabited this world and built this modern civilization and we've enabled all of these things, we are now in a position where women actually have the audacity to believe that they do not need men. When women say they do not need men, here is what they really mean. They do not need men because we have a massive military that keeps the horrifying elements of humanity at bay. They do not need men because men built all of the infrastructure and systems that were required to make sure that their lives are easier and that they have access to everything, to the point where even their caretaker and nurturer role has been oversimplified to the point where they can complete most of their duties in the caretaking nurturing department and raising a family in a very small window of time on a per day basis compared to what the cave women had to go through way back in the day. Unreal. When you say you don't need men, the part that you leave out is that men via the Republic created all of these political and legal institutions that allowed you to actively participate in our system. And what you did instead is you seized that power, you spit in our faces, and now you want to flip the script. And I don't care how much you say, no, feminism isn't about misandry. Feminism isn't about that. It's about equality. I don't care because your actions are showing me that you are going for a power grab. So what I'm trying to say, ladies, is this. You claim that you don't need men for survival. But the reality is, the reason why you have the luxury to say such things is because of everything that men have built up until this point. And had we not built this, and we were much, much closer to an ooga booga situation, bet you any amount of money your ass would fall in line. 
But it's okay that you fall in line because that is how Mother Nature intended it. We don't hold it against you. We don't think you're weak for that. But if you're a man and you behave like that, you bet your ass we're going to think you're weak for that. Because as a man, you're not wired to be provided for and protected. A, a boy, a little child, has to be protected, sure, until he reaches the age where he himself can do the protection and the provisioning. This is another huge difference between men and women. A woman, irrespective of whether she is still a little baby girl all the way up to a grown woman, she is protected and provided for. But for a boy, at some point, he becomes a man. And now he is expected to do the provisioning and the protection. He is expected to give all that. It's bonkers. And then you want to say we're equal. We are not. Okay? And nature has made it so. Another hormone is oxytocin. I talked about this in the difference between pair bonding between men and women. Basically, with men, oxytocin also gets released when he engages in intercourse with women. And if he consistently gets it from the same woman every 48 hours or so or twice a week, other women will look less attractive to him. Why is this? The reason this 48-hour afterglow exists is to incentivize monogamy, loyalty to the family. But what happens when the wife creates a sexless marriage as the gatekeeper of sex and now this man no longer gets access because deep down she did not marry him for love? The reason she married him is much more superficial. She gets shocked when he steps out and cheats. She gets shocked. This is how men operate. Remember, before the whole monogamy thing, it was polygamy. Men were getting what they can. And all we're saying in modern society from a moral perspective is, look, man or woman, you want to be someone with a high body count? You go right ahead. Just understand with that high body count, men and women are going to be looked at differently. It is what it is. Because men have to work for sex, women don't. On the other side, you have the monogamous path. You have men who are willing to give away their commitment for nothing. They're simps. They're weak. They're not respected. And then you have the ones who don't. And they are. It is what it is. But as a woman, just understand that once you pick the polygamous path, you do not get access to the monogamous path anymore. At least not with a guy that you can love, respect, and genuinely desire. While for men, we have seen that they kind of can go back and forth. And you're probably wondering, well, that's not fair. Nature never said it was. But why is it like that? That's a good question. The reason it's like that is because, again, men are wired to get it wherever they can, however they can. If they consistently get it in a monogamous relationship at least twice a week, that man has very little incentive to stray. But to tell a woman this is to ask her to essentially be a sex slave. That's how, that's how a feminist will look at it. Tantamount to slavery. And honestly, we, we laugh at it because it's like, what, is this only enjoyable for me? It's not enjoyable for you? Evidently not. That's a problem. But the way I look at it is this. Whether you get it from monogamy or polygamy. At the end of the day, a man is wired to get it. But the difference is this. If a man just keeps going girl after girl after girl after girl after girl, he doesn't bond to anyone. He doesn't release enough vasopressin to be territorial over any of these single girls. And the cycle repeats. So he never protects anyone. He never provides for anyone. And this is exactly what the Chads, the Brads, and the Harrys do. They don't protect anyone. They don't provide for anyone. They just meet their biological need to reproduce on paper. Because essentially with condoms and and all these things, you're tricking your brain into thinking that you are actually reproducing to create a child. And that is also what pornography does, by the way. It tricks your brain into thinking that you're bonding with someone when you are not. So much so that if you stay addicted to it, you will not be able to bond with anyone else. That 48-hour afterglow effect with digital films happens, which is very, very interesting. You know, But it's still all relatively new. Um, new areas that we're exploring and studying. And that's pretty much it for, um, you know, why it's different for men on one side versus women on the other. And another thing, again, with men, you have another factor called stoicism. Stoicism is 
technically like a term you associate with men because social stigma doesn't stop men. Men have to possess the ability to think for themselves. They're individualistic. They think for themselves. So that means if they have disapproval, they don't care. Now you're probably wondering, okay, well, what happens if the tribe disapproves of a man? Well, they kick him out of the tribe, of course. But here's the thing. A man is built to think for himself. He's faster. He's stronger. He's capable of surviving on his own. And because of this, he can go out into the world and probably form a new tribe or run into another tribe elsewhere. And he will survive because that is what he built to do. He was built to survive. That's what he was built to do. So if he was built to do that, no surprise then that over time we evolved to just completely not be phased by social stigma at all. And that's sort of our natural state of being because we are not limited by this hive mind type deal because we don't have to rely on another gender to protect and provide for us because that is our job to do for them. But they take care of us and they nurture us and support us, which is a very important role, but it's different. And then the last thing for Ooga Booga in the man's brain is pre-selection. This idea that when we go out, and I already mentioned this already, you hunt and all this, you're creating this social proof through the meritocracy, through the social hierarchy, the alpha, the beta, the delta, the gamma, the omega, and the sigma on the outside, the lone wolf. These hierarchies aren't really there to the same degree for women as they are for men. Because remember, hive mind, community, that's what women were wired to do, while men were wired for meritocracy. The best of the best gets the spoils. And that's why it's really the men that go to war and fight to see who deserves the spoils. And that's pretty much it for Ooga Booga and men. So just to recap, hypogamy, mate guarding, um, you know, the territorial nature that comes with infidelity. This is why men have a problem with you going to the club when you're in a relationship with them. Going to the bar, we talked about that in another video. That's what it is. Because the idea of another man touching you, doing things with you, and all this, it destroys us. And I think deep down some of y'all know that, and you use that to your advantage because you're just sick in the head and you need therapy. Another talk, though. So we talked about vasopressin, the protector instinct hormone. We talked about oxytocin and how every 48 hours that incentivizes a man to remain more monogamous. But by withholding it and not giving the oxytocin hit, he's more likely to be polygamous. Because at the end of the day, a man has his drive to go and get it wherever and whenever he can. It is what it is. Stoic indifference, social stigma doesn't affect him. And pre-selection, we know what that is. Lots of women want you, therefore other women say, hey, he's vetted for. I want him. Hive mind approves, so do I. While for women, a little bit different. There's other mechanisms at play. One of the main ones we talk about all the time is hypergamy and the associated hypergamous doubt. So what is hypergamy? Hypergamy is the drive to find the best of the best, the absolute best, the cream of the crop. What is the best I can do? And hypergamous doubt is that little voice in the back of her brain that says, is this guy the best I can do? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, she is going to engage in psychological warfare, often known as shit tests to test a man's masculinity, to test a man's stoicism, to test a man's ability to protect, to provide, to test a man's social calibration and character. But the more confident she is with her choice of man, the less she's going to do that. Hypergamous doubt is basically the female version of that little voice in a man's head. Bill Burr made a joke about this where your dick is just kind of like this little voice in the back here that says, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Hypergamous doubt is basically the female version of that. Oh, he's better than this guy. Come on, go, jump ship, jump ship, jump ship. It's the same exact thing, but a different mechanism. Men are just trying to get whatever they can, less discriminatory. Women are trying to get the best they can, more discriminatory. But everyone knows what hypergamy is at this point. Trying to get the smarter person, the one with the more resources, the one who's more competent, the one who's more masculine, the one who's stronger, faster, better. And ideally... He's socially calibrated. So not only do they expect you to have all the best of the best of the masculine skills, they actually expect you to pick up on that social calibration that women have a knack for as well. No pressure, guys. War brides is another phenomenon. One of the things, because men are aggressive and they're warlike creatures, 
one of the things that women had to adapt to was this idea of being invaded by an outside force and the possibility of their protectors failing to do so. And as a result, they now have new protectors. Vikings is a great example of this. They would abduct the women and bring them home to their tribes. But of course, it was going on way before that. But women essentially were more likely to have Stockholm Syndrome and things like this where they they connect with their captors in a meaningful way and all that. Because what would happen to the men? The men would just get butchered like animals. So of course the men constantly getting butchered again and again and again and again means the man has no need to have this whole war brides thing for survival. Because chances are they weren't going to make it through the battle. Therefore it doesn't exist. But almost always at the tail end of these battles, the women survived. And the women now had new men that they had to submit to and follow. And by doing that, women had to be able to get over things a lot more quickly than men did. And I think this is a great way to explain why men have a really, really hard time getting over women that break them, especially with this whole infidelity thing. Okay? Well, for women, they have a much, much easier time switching between guys. We call it monkey branching. And I think the reason why that is, is again, because of this whole war brides thing. And that ties into her ooga booga brain. Alpha widow. What's that? The best she's ever had. Put simply, the best she's ever had. So if a guy can rock her world 10 times better than you can, again, I love referencing this scene from from close um, closer. Yeah. Just saw the movie yesterday, but it was it was just really good and it's just so vividly burned into my brain. Where, you know, he one of the questions that he asked when he found out that his his wife was cheating was, was he better than me? That is a man who is astutely aware of alpha imprint and how it works. If a man has more sexual prowess than you and he successfully leaves that imprint on a woman and he's better than you, you're done. And I think deep down, this is again, religion being based. This is why they they cared about the whole, you know, save yourself for marriage and all that stuff because they knew. They knew Alpha Imprint was not conducive to a strong family unit. It wasn't. You want to destroy a family unit, nothing quite like a nuclear Alpha Imprint from GigaChat. There's nothing quite like it. It'll do the job. But it's not really her fault that that Alpha Imprint did what it's supposed to do. Because exactly right, it did what it's supposed to do. It was nature communicating to her that this is the best. And this is why when she does not marry the best... There is a hypergamous doubt associated with this alpha widow that tells her, nah, you, you, you could do better than this. But the part that her programming doesn't tell her, her programming doesn't tell her about dating apps. Her programming doesn't tell her about Chad's options. Her programming doesn't tell her about all the modern innovations that feminism likes to claim overrode nature. Oh, come on, Peter. That was 100,000 years ago. We're way past that as a species. Technology does not undo ooga booga. Modern civilization does not undo ooga booga. It does not. So, that is Alpha Widow. And the other thing we talk about all the time is body count. When a woman has sex with a man, she cannot separate the emotion from the act, while a man can. This makes sense, because men need to go out and get as much as they can wherever they can. Emotionally bonding like that would really screw things up. But for a woman who's looking for the best, when she lets someone breach the gates, that is her operating under the assumption that this is the best at that given time that she can do. It's subconscious. So the oxytocin gets released and she bonds to him. Okay? So what happens if you keep forming more and more and more and more bonds? By the time you get to an average Joe, when you've been through these really intense bonds with the Chads, the Harrys, and the Brads, is it any wonder you cannot form an effective bond with an average Joe? The saying goes, you can't miss what you never had. And that is true. You can't miss what you never had. You can feel like you missed out, and I already have said in other videos why FOMO is a really bad idea. 
It's not worth it. The juice isn't worth the squeeze. If you manage to make it to marriage without giving up your body excessively, that is a win as a woman. Okay? And ideally, on the other end, you got a man who's experienced enough that he can show you the ropes so that you can please him the way he likes it and he can please you the way you like it. And in that regard, you are both happy. And outside those doors, nobody else has to know anything. Simple as that. But yeah, the the sexual liberation movement and the destabilization and deregulation of the sexual marketplace, that, that did a real number, man. And now it's pretty much an auction. It is a sexual auction. The highest bidder gets to do the imprint. And anyone else who tries to bond with that person after is going to have a really hard time. There are women that can have a lot of bodies, though, and no imprint ever happens. But what I am saying is once the imprint does happen, it is essentially the male version of the wall. Don't even try to scale it. Don't even try to get past that wall. Don't even try to build bridges. It's a waste of time, bro. That wall is up. And it ain't coming down anytime soon. So yeah, Alpha Widow is definitely no joke. And the oxytocin and this pair bonding thing ties into that. Women do mate guard as well. It's a little bit different, though. Because it's hive mind, remember? So with women, what they do is they'll like tell another girl that could potentially be a threat to her getting access to her mate. She might tell her that she's good just the way she is so that she doesn't improve as a woman. So when your competition isn't out improving and they're accepting their their level that they're at and they think their level that they're at is good, they will never ascend to your level and threaten to take your man away from you. So, I mean, that's kind of their version of mate guarding. As you can see, it's a much more socially calibrated, less physical and confrontational, aggressive mate guarding like men do. It's a little bit more cunning. So that's no surprise. But a big, big thing that we always talk about is social disapproval. And I saved this one for last. When you ask women questions about things like body count, you ask women questions, things about, you know, well, what would you do in this situation? Basically, men's versions of shit tests. You posit these types of questions that could reveal unflattering realities about it. Women will say whatever they have to say, not all, but most, who do not consciously think about these things and reflect introspectively. They will avoid social disapproval at all costs. They cannot be stigmatized. When you have a society in place, though, where stigma is ready willing and able to be applied hypergamy is kept in check just as polygamy is kept in check for men you have a marketplace where monogamy can thrive and family units can thrive we have the opposite the family unit is shattered single mothers are at an all-time high fatherless homes all-time high divorce rates all-time high again deregulated marketplace we're going back to ooga booga before monogamy really became a thing. There's no time to build this 48-hour afterglow. There is no room to create an effective pair bond that's going to last a long time. There is only the alpha imprint. Only the war brides. Only the streets. So if you're a guy like me who likes monogamy as a concept, because I grew up in a household where monogamy clearly works, you're going to have a hard time. You can find a needle but you got quite the haystack to contend with. And we always come back to that question. Is it worth it to go through all that haystack to get to you? Or are you willing to meet us halfway? What's it going to be? So avoiding that social disapproval at all costs. This is why you see things like, hey, let's say a girl finds a chat at a party. She goes into the bathroom with him. They do some stuff. They walk out. All her girlfriends are there. The hive mind disapproves. She accuses him of the R word ruins his reputation because avoiding social disapproval you did a bad thing and you need to be held accountable for the bad thing you did oh no let's just say he r-worded me he essayed let's just say that and if we say that well now i don't have to be held accountable and all the laws seem to be this way too the divorce laws seem to be pro uh accountability on men but anti-accountability on women The abortion laws are set up the same way. Give her all the authority, him no authority. Him all the responsibility, her no responsibility. This is not coincidence. When you put people that seek to avoid social disapproval or those who support people who seek to avoid social disapproval in charge, you have laws that reflect avoiding social disapproval at all costs. 
laws based on feelings. So why is there this really strong urge to avoid social disapproval? Very simple. Remember when I said if a man gets kicked out of the tribe, he could survive on his own? <laughs> you think a woman could go up against a saber-toothed tiger? Don't get me wrong, some of them did. There were always outliers that may have survived. But by and large, mm -mm. and women knew it. So when the threat of getting kicked out of the tribe was on the horizon, women were like, oh shit. Yo, I saw what happened to that snoo snoo lady, bro. She got eaten up by that saber toothed tiger. Yellow Power Ranger was in town. And the other girls were like, oh shit, word? Yeah, I ain't doing that. Sleeping around? Yeah, I ain't doing that. Being masculine and back talk? Yeah, I ain't doing that. Not taking care of the kids? Yeah, I ain't doing that. <laughs> but now you got a society that's too comfortable, too safe, fall of Rome scenario. Bowling pins being set up. We're waiting for the ball to come in and knock it all down. Unless somebody can exercise some restraint and hit the great reset before it's too late. So, that's pretty much it for social disapproval. And kind of why women are so big on avoiding that social disapproval. While men, they don't really care. And I think that's what women like about men. They like that men don't care. Because if a man doesn't really care, she could look at him and be like, oh, I can follow that. I'm over here worrying about caring and stuff. He's just going to go out and take care of it. That's what's up. And all you have to do is reciprocate. But you're not going to do that because you're entitled to everything. And, of course, the last thing is preserve value, which we I think we've already talked about. You know, fidelity, maintain social approval, that sort of thing. Promiscuity is not conducive to, um, to the survival of the family unit. And that's why men have a problem with it. Men want their legacy. Men are very territorial. And what's the number one way to shit on a man's legacy? By bringing in a kid that's not his. That's how you piss on a legacy. You get knocked up by another guy. Let him put his filthy claws all over you. You pass on his legacy. Then you tell me it's my legacy. Only for me to find out it's not my legacy can't figure out why my caveman comes out in that moment and i'm feeling a certain kind of way about it aside from the fact that mother nature made it so i think even on moral grounds it's pretty obvious why we have a problem with it and that's pretty much it for the female half of ooga booga so let's just recap that side really quick and then i think we'll call it a night because this video is going pretty long we talked about hypergamy always looking to get the best deal the best of the best hypergamous doubt what is that that's her version of the man's little head. It's the woman's little head. The man's little head says, do it, 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 do it. The woman's little head says, I think you can do better. I think you can do better. I think you can do better. That's her version of do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. We know this. War Brides is the phenomenon of women getting over breakups much quicker than men. Why? Because when invaders came, they killed all the men. So men never had to develop the War Brides thing. This is why men are the idealistic romantics, while women are not. They're more practical and pragmatic with their mate selection. It's the one thing that they're really logical and pragmatic about, the cold calculus of mate selection. Why? Because there's always a chance that their protectors could be slaughtered the next day. Modern civilization does not negate Ooga Booga. The Ooga Booga is baked in. This is nature versus nurture. This is nature. It's baked in. Comes right out of the oven. And then whatever you get from nurture, the environment, that compounds on top of that. And that kind of gives you a more unique personality. So that's the whole War Brides thing. Alpha Widow, the best she's ever had. The Alpha Imprint. As a man, if you are not it, she's always going to look for better than you. Alpha Widow is the number one thing that's going to make that hypergamous doubt go on full blast. Max volume. Caps lock. It is what it is. She will compare every single successive sexual partner that she has to that Alpha Imprint until someone measures up to or surpasses it. The pair bond, as a result of that imprint, is so intense that she will probably put up with almost anything to get that guy's commitment, while she will take yours for granted, because you're a joke by comparison. And the oxytocin goes into that. Her oxytocin reward center, every single time that she has a partner, oxytocin releases, and she bonds with that person. But very much like every other addiction, with each successive hit, the reward is smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually you go from all 
pleasure to no pain, to all pain, no pleasure. And that's the whole hoe phase in the sexual validation addiction we've talked about in other videos. And that's tied to this whole alpha widow, oxytocin and bonding, trying to figure out how to relive the best you've ever had. Only to realize the best you ever had never really wanted you in the first place. It's cruel, I know. There's mate guarding, where women will say some shit like, ooh, I like your dress, and then the girl's like, ooh, thanks. She thinks she's great just exactly as she is. She doesn't strive to be better, and then she never comes anywhere near the level of this girl where she could threaten to take her man. Again, unlike men who mate guard through physical aggression, women use their gift for social calibration to do so. Social disapproval, I've already covered that. The idea that women will avoid social disapproval at all costs. Because even though there is no threat of being thrown to the wolves through tribe exile, her ooga booga brain has it baked in that she's going to get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or become bear lunch if she attracts enough social disapproval to be exiled from the tribe. It is what it is. There are some women out there that do use that frontal lobe and they're like, listen, I know my, my instincts are telling me this, but realistically, logically speaking, it's not going to happen. I'm going to be okay. Um, but that's a minority because that would require critical thought and not operating on I feel like. And then, of course, last but not least, the whole preserve value thing. So we covered that. We covered the ooga booga in men. We covered the big picture of what ooga booga is. The main takeaway for what ooga booga is is this. When you're baking in the oven for nine months, there is some stuff grounded in evolutionary psychology. There are things that are just hardwired in to your brain. And there is nothing that you can do to unwire that. The natural instincts. Okay? It's in there. The closer you get to a survival situation, the more likely that those auto responses are going to happen. The further you are from a survival situation, the easier it's going to be to deviate from gender roles but just understand what makes it baked in is that the minute we get back to a survival situation, ooga booga! And that's what it's all about. So I hope you enjoyed the video. That was a lot to unpack. As I said, there's a gamma male nerd somewhere. I know that was an ad hominem, so I'm going to draw it back. Sorry. That's going to say, actually, it's pseudoscience. And that's cool, bro. But one day, we're going to be looking at this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when we understand the human brain even more, and I got a pretty damn good gut feeling, we're going to be confirming a lot of what we have been confirming ourselves collectively through anecdotal evidence. And we have these explanatory hypotheses in place that are going to become theories. And eventually we're going to have like the psychology equivalent of the theory of evolution or the theory of gravity and so on and so on and so on. So yeah, hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike, call me an asshole, say I talk too much, that I ramble too much, but whatever you do, don't report the video. It's useful info, and I'm going to catch you out for the next one. Ooga bugger! Later.